Well, we got to the point <coughs> where, in one verse, they take care of the history of a larger people than the Nephites. It just simply says they crossed the ocean and landed here, and that was that, you see. Why don't they talk about that? That's that, that uh, 15th verse of, uh, well, it won't two verses. I'm getting really generous here. 15th and 16th verses of Omni here. And uh, why, why doesn't he tell us more about the, why doesn't he tell us more about a lot of people? We're going to get a lot of that here. Remember, the Book of Mormon is the religious history of one family, and that's all. He's, he's told us that time and again, the kings and the wars, they're all there, but they're in other books as far as that goes, and they're small things. And so we go on here, and he's going to tell us about it. Uh, they had many wars and contentions. I'm not going to tell you about them because I'm not even telling you about the Nephite wars, he says. Their language had become corrupted because they had no records. How corrupted has it become? Remember, they had come from Jerusalem, but they were a mixed bag. We, when we talked about Lakish, we saw they were mixed that way. And uh, they picked up people from everywhere. We don't know to this day there's no agreement whether the language taught, uh, talked in Palestine in the time of Christ was Aramaic or whether it was Hebrew. Something was even Greek, as far as that goes. But uh, their language became corrupted. Well, what do you mean corrupted? Any language you speak is the language of the people. That's what the lingua is. It's the, it's the lingua franca. It's the language that everybody speaks, and that's the official language. No matter how much has been changed, every language has changed immensely. But they'd, they'd separated from Jerusalem for 350 years. So they couldn't understand each other. It was a dialectical difference. Two years ago, we were visited by some cousins from the Hebrides. Those are islands off the west coast of England, up Scotland, up the north there. And, uh, we drove around the valley and showed them the sights, and they chatted merrily but among themselves. They went along looking at the sights, and we couldn't understand a single word they said. They spoke straight English, but we couldn't understand one word they said. They had to translate the thing for us. Well, how could that be? Our families both left England at the same time in 620, 621, and they stopped there, but the rest of the family went over to County Antrim and, and uh, in... Uh, in Ireland, in Ireland, the west coast of Ireland, settled there and went on speaking English, the kind, the very kind we do today. It's the same thing today. In fact, we speak that, that dialect here. A west coast, a west country English dialect is what we speak. That's our western R and so forth. So we went on and spoke our kind of English, but they stayed in the Hebrides, and for 350 years we were separated, and now we can't understand them. That's exactly the amount of time here that these people have been separated since they left Jerusalem. These people went over, they spoke theirs, they didn't have records. And they may have been speaking another dialect because it's, it's a great deal to indicate to see that Lehi and his people were, uh, were from the desert. They're from the west. They're from Manasseh. Remember, he's descended from Manasseh. And that means, that means many of them would be east of the Jordan, yes? Is it possible that with the Mulekite migration that there were Phoenicians? There could be all sorts of a mixed bag because they got a lot of people together. Anyone who was going to get out, remember this member of the royal family was there. So they could have and been he had circulated. Remember, was it this the little kid? Uh, uh, who had gone around to, to the village. He was a member of the royal family. He was the, the youngest one, and he was the one who survived. They got out when they heard, heard the news because he was war busy warning the others, uh, risking the others. That's on Yahoo. With the Nibli? Yes. Could this also be perhaps where they got the name Timothy from? I hear that Timothy is a Greek Oh, no, name. the Greek names. Remember, we said that before. In Lehi's day, Palestine was swarming with Greeks, important Greeks and so forth. Remember, uh, it was Egyptian territory at that time, Egyptian culture, and the Egyptian army, Neko's army, was all Greek mercenaries almost entirely. We have inscriptions from that very time up the, up the Nile at Aswan, inscriptions from the mercenaries of the Egyptian army, and they're all in Greek. So uh, Greek was very common, uh, especially the name Timotheus was very common. Well, that uh, was a common name on Cyprus, and of course uh, Cyprus is, was Greek at that time. No, the, it is, remember, there's a great mix-up here, and it continues right over here. We're going to see a lot of it. Well, this isn't what gets us so much as the, well, in 350 years after the Norman and Saxon English. See, uh, the superior, the, the people with the records come in, and they take over, you see. And uh, that's what happened when the Normans came into England. The Norman minority mixed with the Saxons, and within another 350 years, you had Chaucer's English. So these things take place that way. 
But this is what happened. Now, there, notice back here, it wasn't over just the people of Zarahemla, but there was a man called Zarahemla, a leader called Zarahemla among them. He seems to have been a, a very genial duck. He uh, agreed to, to all sorts of things. He united with Mosiah, agreed to have him made king. Notice in the 15, 14th verse here it says, and also Zarahemla rejoiced exceedingly. He was just too happy for words to find out about these records, uh, the plates, because they brought the plates. They knew about that. Uh, he was a leader, apparently. He knew more about it than most of them. And then here, and it came to pass after they were taught in the language of Mosiah, would that take years and years? No, no, that just a, just a week or so to, to the language being the two dialects, begin to understand each other. It wouldn't take very long. And uh, gave a genealogy of his fathers according to his memory. Well, yesterday I had my home teacher, it was Brother Mosiah, uh, Amosa, who is a gigantic, who is a huge uh, uh, Samoan. His father's a chief there. His father had just come uh, just two days ago, he's just come from Samoa to tell how things were doing the old country. It's very interesting what he says, but the thing is, he can recite the genera uh, genealogy back 20 or 30 generations, you see, they, but by heart, you see, they know the genealogy about the islanders do. And that's the sort of thing these people have done. Zarahemla knew it by heart, he was the chief. Zarahemla gave a genealogy of his father, see, this isn't the people, this is the man speaking. And he was their, their chief, we'd say, of his fathers according to his memory, and that's the way it's done. <laughs> And the people of Zarahemla and Mosiah united together, they joined together, and decided Mosiah would be their king with no objection from Zarahemla. I say he was a, a genial person, only too glad to have them, you see. Uh, but yeah, Mosiah is the king only of the, of the migrant Nephites and the Mulekites. Here, he's not the king of the, of the Nephites back home. Remember, Mosiah had to move out back here in the, uh, the 11th verse, no revelation, no prophecy. The lights went out, it's time to move on, and then Mosiah moved out with his people. And he took the records with him, so he was a person of importance there. And uh, here's another one. It came to pass in the days of Mosiah, there was a large stone brought unto him with engravings on it, and he did interpret the engravings by the gift and power of God. How does that happen? Well, uh, George Smith, when they started in the middle of the 19th century, when they started uh, uh, shipping crates of cuneiform doctrine uh, documents from the British Museum uh, where uh, Grotefen and others were excavating in Nineveh. Started getting these records and George Smith used to pile them up. He worked with them. Nobody knew how to read it. It was a complete thing until it was finally cracked later. Uh, but George Smith learned how to, uh, suddenly God was able to read them just by dealing, just by handling with them, looking at them and so forth. He was suddenly able to read them. And the same thing with Llewellyn Griffith. Llewellyn Griffith could read Meroitic. That's the language of Upper Egypt. When the people were driven out of Jerusalem, they went, the priests of Thebes fled, went to the Upper Nile, and they took Egyptian with them, the records and so forth, and they developed a language of their own called Meroitic that no one can read to this day. But Llewellyn Griffith could read it. He was a Welshman with a Welshman's mystic gift for language, I suppose, and none of his pupils ever picked it up. But he had that, uh, that great intuitive gift. Intuitive gives a very important thing in something like Egyptian. Well, you know when you're reading things, you have some few languages people will know. But in a good day, it's like falling off a log. Everything is perfectly clear, and you wonder if it ever, ever bothered you. But if you have a bad day, or haven't had enough sleep, or if you lose confidence, you might as well forget it. You're not going to read anything that day. You see, you're not, you can't do it if you don't have the faith or have the confidence. But when you feel gung-ho and, and have perfect confidence, you can just sail along with a, with a Coptic or Aramaic text, no trouble at all. But other times, don't even give it a try. So it, it is a gift. It's, you know it with yourself, the language, from your own experience. Well, they brought these stones, and they had this, and he had the gift and power of God, and he told what they were saying, what they said this coriantomer, and uh, he was discovered by the people of Zarahemla. Now, they'd been there for 350 years, and he lived with them for nine months, <coughs> and that, uh, which shows that the Jaredites survived at least 500 years, uh, at least until, rather, in, until 500 B.C. There were Jaredites around. They went thousands of years before, maybe 2000 B.C., I think much, much earlier. It doesn't make any difference, and, and they became... <laughs> The, upon this north country, remember, the people who were destroyed upon the north country. They were the Woods Indians, Plain Indians, and others like that. Had a great culture up there once. But they had been destroyed, and <coughs> they came from the tower. Notice it doesn't say the Tower of Babel. That's very important. Uh, as a matter of fact, we learn from e the Book of Ether and the Book of Mormon. Uh, the name isn't Babel, but it's Nimrod, which is exactly what it was. Remember, it went north into the Valley of Nimrod, and of course, uh, 
Now we know that uh, traditionally and everything else, the tower was called Nimrod's Tower, because Babel doesn't come into later. So, they came out from the tower. See, it's careful not to say Tower of Babel. I say Tower of Babel was later, but Nimrod's Tower was that one, and it tells us, in a, say, in the second, uh, in the first verse of the second chapter of the book of Ether, Ether 2 and 1, they went up into the valley northward where there never had man been, and it was the valley of Nimrod. Nimrod was the big name at that time. I've written a great deal about Nimrod, but we won't go into that here. And the time the language is confounded and so forth, and their bones lay scattered in the land. Mo that's a literary expression, or their bones could still be there, but in various stages of decomposition, I suppose. That's from their latest war. And behold, I, <coughs> and Malachi is writing this, see, was born in the days of Mosiah. See, he's giving us, he's looking back on history. And I have lived to see his death, and Benjamin his son reigning in his stead. And King Benjamin, and under him the two governments fuse, of course. And Benjamin, he drove out, uh, he defended Zarahemla from, uh, from Lamanite attacks. He drove them out of the land of Zarahemla. And then the 25th verse, and I having no seed. Now, Malachi has no children, so he hands them over to King Benjamin. And remember, they've been kept in separate Separate archives, the royal archive of the, of the doings of state and the, and the wars and so forth, and the family archive of the revelations and inspirations that's been handed down. That's the one we're getting. But here they're joined in one, and uh, Benjamin unites them. The king from now on keeps all the records in his archive. And Benjamin has a passion for these records. He's a, he's a great antiquarian, we'll find out. He, he's keeping the records after, after he ceases to be king. He still keeps the records. I shall deliver up these plates to him, Benjamin. He's the man to have them. So the two governments fuse, and the plates are now in the hands of one king again. And he says, uh, and they come to all men and to God and, be and believe in prophesying and revelations and in the ministering of angels and in the gift of tongues. Uh, notice, in the gift of tongues and in the interpreting of language. They had these gifts among them, which indicates they had more than one language. They must have had quite a number of languages or dialects, as far as the case may be. And then, he, in the 26th verse, he testifies to the atonement. Yea, come unto him and offer your souls as an offering to him. Continue in fasting and praying and enduring to the end. That's the, that's the formula, see, fasting, praying, enduring to the end. As the Lord liveth, you will be saved. Now, he says, I would speak a certain number. They wanted to go back to them. Remember, these people, Mosiah had led them out when the things had become too corrupt in the land of the Nephites. Now people wanted to go back to the old country. They're homesick. They want to see what it's like back there and want to, want to go back to Jackson County. They went up into the wilderness to return to the land of Nephi, for there was a large number who wanted to go back and possess the land of their inheritance. That's their country. Perhaps it was a better country than the one they were in, I don't know. And that's the, the 27th verse, so they migrate back again. But here's a, a nice psychological touch, a true touch. There have been many an enterprise that's been ruined by a leader with too much authority. You notice their leader was a, a strong and mighty man. Well, good, that qualifies him, but he's also stiff-necked, wherefore he caused contention among them. And they were all slain, save 50. What American settlement do you think of when you hear about that? Jamestown, of course. The Jamestown was the most blooming, most promising enterprise in Virginia. 17th century, they went and settled But they were quarreling among them, and they disappeared completely. Nobody knows what happened to Jamestown. Jamestown was to be the biggest settlement in the New World. They had their, they had their, uh, their deeds and their contracts and everything else to the land, and uh, Jamestown, from King James, and the uh, colony disappeared just because of quarreling among themselves. The same sort of thing happens here. Contentional, they were all slaves, they had 50 in the wilderness, and they went back to Zarahemla, and, uh, but they still didn't give up. We've got to go back again. So finally he ends up, came to pass, they also took others into the wilderness, and my brother went with them, he said. I, Malachi, had a brother, and he went with them, and I don't know what's happened to them since. Now this shows uh, the planting of the tribes and, and the customs. They're moving all over like this. We're just following one line, a red line of history here. Let's see what's happening in the continent all over the place. He and his brother goes out and they go and settle. He's not heard of them since. Well, they could settle. There are people wandering in all directions here. It's a very complex picture, mixing with others. So now we come to the words of Mormon. And please note the date of this. This was written 500 years after the other books we've been reading. The last of the short books comes because he's summarizing later. He's looking back on the whole thing after the curtain's gone down. He's the epilogue, you see. 
I am a, I am alone. Remember from the formula from Job, I am alone. I'm saved to tell thee. So the lone survivor is a is an important theme in literature and history. The, the one who who survives and tells the history. Uh, there's some famous there's some famous ones in literature, of course. The uh, I, Mormon, the son of Moroni, have witnessed almost all the destruction of my people, the Nephites. So he comes at the end. This is the theme. Uh, was this going to spoil the ending, incidentally? We know how the Book of Mormon is going to end now. Does this spoil it, if you know how it's going to turn out? Well, no, this is the theme of the Book of Mormon. They want us to keep it constantly in mind. This is a bleak thing, speaking of fear and trembling, you see. Who's going to write our epitaph here? Uh, so the, from the first page to the last, we're reminded the people were destroyed, the people were destroyed, the people were destroyed, and so forth. And uh, why bother us with that story? Well, it, it bothers us. They insist on bothering us with that story. I have witnessed almost all the destruction of my people. It supposes me that uh, he will witness the entire destruction. See, after many, uh, I will, to the hands of my son, Mormon, to his son Moroni, you see, and it supposeth me that he will witness the entire destruction. They were scattered and, and destroyed, as you know. They, they're not, they're still alive. And many, many of them went out and joined the Lamanites. Great droves of them were doing it at that time. And someday it may profit them, you notice, after the destruction. That's like comparing Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed from time to time, it says. The same thing, the people are destroyed. Well, if they're all destroyed, how can it profit them someday? Well, it doesn't mean that, see, they're survivors as far as that goes. But destroy, I says, means to break down the structure of the thing. That sort of thing. So they were all destroyed, and it's, it's for them. Well, he searches among the records. He has plenty of time, which had been delivered to my hands, and he found these plates among the records. So it must have been quite a heap of them, quite a pile of them. From Jacob down to King Benjamin. That's the books we've just had here. He's just given them to us. It's pleasing me because of the prophecies in them. Many of them have been fulfilled down to this day, he says in the fourth verse, and there's more to come. That's why I'm going to deliver this. There's more to come after him, and there is. He's not the last one, you see. So I finish my record. The remainder I shall take from the plates of Nephi. Now, why these plates? It's for a wide purpose. It whispereth me, he says. He has this feeling, this very strong feeling, that uh, these records have a purpose here for a wise purpose. And this is the spirit of the Lord which is in me. It's my idea. I've, I've got to save these things. See, and he worketh in me to do according to his will. Notice he's not talking about visitations of angels or uh, revelations or things, but this is the feelings, the intense feeling a person can have. It works in me, he says. It's the spirit of the Lord which is in me. It whispers to me. You have this strong urge. That's what, notice there are many levels of revelation in the Book of Mormon. That's a very interesting thing. When, when Lehi says, for example, I have dreamed a dream. In other words, I have seen a vision. Well, which is it? Well, where do you draw the line? As long as it's in inspiration and it's true. My prayer is to God is that my brethren may once again come to a knowledge of God. So his brethren are going to survive. Once again come to a knowledge of God. It's addressed to them primarily. That they may once again become a delightsome people. Nothing said about change of race or color or anything like that. They're so mixed up by now. But delightsome is what we mean. Delighting, delighting the Lord. I make my record from the plates of Nephite, he says. Now, Amalekai, he's the last one we read. He's the, one, the last one just before the words of Mormon. The book of Omni ends with Amalekai. And delivered these plates into the hands of King Benjamin. So King Benjamin got them. Notice he's repeating here. And he took them and put them with the other plates, so the two records are now combined, which are, had been handed down by the kings. From King Benjamin, from generation to generation, they've been handed down then to my hands for 500 years. More than 500 years, actually. And there are great things written upon them, out of which my people shall be judged. Now, Benjamin had some contention among his people. Notice he picks up with Benjamin. That's where he's going to start. And here in these two verses, he confirms what Omni told us, what we're told in the 24th verse here by, by um, Malachi, where he talks about by Malachi. He says the same thing. The King Benjamin gathered together his armies and stood against them with his sword, and he drove out the Lamanites and... and brought peace to them. What about this sort of layman always popping up? But remember, in ancient times and medieval times, nothing was more valuable than a good sword because nothing was rarer. The steel of a Damascus sword, we're supposed to say, oh, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. The steel of a Damascus sword could cut through an anvil, I mean, so it is said. And when you had a sword like that, it was extremely precious. Now, you know all, the most famous sword of all, the sword in the stone, which was which sword? Excalibur, wasn't it? The, uh, and that sword was handed down. The person who had that sword would have more than 
more than human power. And so swords, there, there are some famous swords. Uh, Salahuddin had one. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other famous sword, but you could see why a sword would be very valuable and why it would be among the national treasures. And the sword of Laban has been handed down among the national treasures for that thing. And he contended against the Lamanites and he drove them out of the, la out of the lands of their inheritance. Notice always Nephites fight on their own ground. Uh, they claim no other. He drove them out of the lands of their inheritance of the Lamanites, of the lands of the Nephites' inheritance. And there came false Christs, and there were all these false teachers. There were a lot of them going around. They were allowed to teach as far as that goes. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be active, but they were according to their crimes, not according to their beliefs or teachings, but according to their crimes. They committed them, and they could catch them in them. Uh, and false teachers punished them according to their crimes. Remember, Satan was cast out of heaven, not because he voted against the great plan that the council passed on, you know, we have many counts of this in places like the Abaton and so forth, but because when he lost, he took to arms, he refused to accept the verdict, and immediately they revolted a third of the hosts of heaven and were cast out, in a twinkling they were cast out. For that reason, not because he dissented, not because he had a different idea, but because uh, he resorted to violence and force to, to put it over. Well. And there were many dissensions. Here's your race problem again. Dissension means the people left and went out to move by themselves or to join other groups. And this happened with the Nehors on a big scale, and it's still going on. Many dissensions unto the Lamanites. The Lamanites are getting almost a steady uh, increase or influx of, of Nephite blood. So we're getting this mixture going on all the time. This idea that anything you find, you see, uh, in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere is either Nephite or Lamanite is utterly absurd, you see. Both Nephites and Lamanites are minorities as far as that goes by this time. And King, Be remember it to has told us before, we'll call them Lamanites and call them Nephites as political labels. That's what they were. King Benjamin was a holy man. Now, he fused the records, it says, and he reigned over his people in righteousness. There were many holy men. It was a sacral state, you see. And they, but they had to use that much sharpness still going on, the same as ever, to keep people in line. And uh, they had to use the much sparkless, and this was the price of peace. Benjamin, by laboring with all his might of his body and faculty of his soul, and also the prophets, did once more establish peace in the land. Notice the faculty of his soul, the might of his body, all the strength he could. The faculty of his soul was not that exerted on the Lamanites. This isn't a military action we're talking about. This is what it takes. And the prophets did once more, he with the prophets, exerting his whole soul, cooperation with the prophets, they established peace in the land. Now we come to the marvelous book of Mosiah. See, I've been rushing to get to it, because we wanted to get to it this way. I'm very happy we can, too. Yeah, so here we go. Uh, notice it begins with uh, the happy land. They've, they've had a long period of prosperity now. It tells us, there was no more contention in all the land of Zarahemla. The curtain rises on a very happy scene, and they're going to have a big celebration, a national celebration to celebrate their, their victory, their success, their long years of peace. And uh, their king was, was a, a great hero with them because of all the things he'd done. So that King Benjamin had continual peace all the remainder of his days. Now there was a long peace here, as I say. This is a happy situation that we begin in. And uh, the subject of this first chapter, how, is is com com communication, you see here. Talking, the whole thing is talking about plates and records. That's what this is, is this introductory passage. And uh, the second chapter is the one that takes up. Notice he says here, now I said that uh, Benjamin was a great antiquarian. He was just the one to take the records because he was very much concerned with this. He called his three sons, Mosiah, Hiloram, and Helaman, and he caused that they should be taught in all the language of his father. See, there's this more complexity. That they may have their understanding. Uh, the language has changed, and they must use the original text. We should take some hints from this, you see. So they could understand the scriptures when they read them, concerning the prophecies that had been spoken by the mouths of their fathers, because they were in another language now. And he says, my sons, third verse, Though they had many prophets, notice, I sons, I would that ye should remember, were it not for these plates which contain these records, these commandments, we must have suffered in ignorance, in spite of the fact that all along they've been having many prophets. So don't get the idea that because we have a prophet, you don't have to pay much attention to scripture. Get this idea, a living prophet, to answer all our questions and solve all our problems for us. Nothing could be more absurd than that, but here, the uh, 
For it not for these plates, we must have suffered in ignorance, not knowing the mysteries of God. Well, don't prophets reveal mysteries of God and so forth? The Lord told Joseph Smith, remember, if I've told you a thing once, I won't tell you again, you see. If it's in the scriptures, don't ask me about it. You, can, you look it up yourself. I'm not going to repeat these things. If you don't take advantage of the revelations we have, we're not going to have more. The heavens have been silent. There's a good reason for it. It's possible that our father, Lekai, he having, noticed this fourth verse, he having been taught in the language of the Egyptians, therefore he could read these engravings. So these engravings were, those are the, those are the, we saw, remember the Martin Harris and the plates with the engravings on them. Did that also refer to the brass plates? The, uh, no, the brass plates, were, well, they, yeah, they were, in, they were in Hebrew in all probability. The, the bronze plates, brass plates. No, they were the record of the Hebrews been kept by the Jews. Well, but they were kept by the Jews since they left Egypt, too. And the, the fact that uh, in 700 BC they introduced this, uh, which is so very convenient, the demotic script, which could be written in just, just a tiny little fraction of what it takes in Hebrew. And Hebrew is very hard, it's very clumsy, and they never, notice there's never been a cursive Hebrew. You always have to write each letter separate right to this day. They don't run letters together speedily, they're doing any normal cursive that's crazy. And uh, that, for that reason, they could very well have adopted, right at the beginning, could have adapted that demotic script whatever it was, but he could read these things and teach them to his children, so they've been handed down, and they taught them to their children, fulfilling the commandments of God, even down to this present time, which is 470 years later here. Uh, and most ancient records are kept by priests also, and uh, never in the, rarely in the vernacular, almost never in the vernacular. So you have, in the Middle Ages, if you're keeping a record in anything, it had to be in Latin, that was required, though Latin was none was not the language of any of the nations of Europe at that time native, except, well, Spain, Spain and Italy and so forth, and France. They were all dialects of Latin, but you kept in classical Ciceronian Latin, you kept the records, and they all kept records. If you're going to read any chronicles, we have the Monumenta here, and uh, we have the Pat Patrologia, but especially we have the Monumenta from the Middle Ages. We have monuments, collections of great records. You have great collections of medieval records here, and all in Latin as far as that. Unless it's in the East, of course, then it has to be in Greek, as far as that goes. And unless it's in other places, it has to be in, in Coptic, which was invented for the purpose. Coptic was invented for the purpose of keeping records. It's a very interesting thing. They use 14 old Egyptian hieroglyphs in it, and they mix Greek letters with it, and they get Coptic. So that's the way you do. You have a special, a special technique of record keeping and a special language for the record keepers, and they have to learn it to, for the sake of continuity, because as the language changed, but of course there are exceptions. You have the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, which are very valuable, the Laud and the Parker manuscripts, the Anglo-Saxon chronicles go way back. And they're good, they're in Old English and so forth. Use them. Well, yes? Didn't the common people depend on the leaders to be taught the gospel? Yes, they depend very much. These prophets, notice there are many holy men. They always had to work on, they were always being, well, the people weren't so excited about it. They didn't come to meeting very often. As you said here, when we, and they, did speak with the, and they did speak the word of God with power and, and authority and use much sharpness because of the stiff nakedness of the people. So these, the holy men always had to crack down on them. You had that sort of thing, sure. And, uh, oh, I would, uh, you should know these things are true. These records are true, also the plates of Nephi, because we have them before our eyes. He testifies to them. Um, and of course, we're not... Speaking of these records here, remember the Lord says, there are no end to my works or my words. And the monad has no windows. Every creature wants, as I've written down here, wants to get in on everything it can. Before you can get in on a project, you must know about it. And without the record, you are living in a closet. And we have a closet mentality. Uh, and without the records, we. We have no memory, though. We have the scope of an insect, you see, as far as that goes. You can see only what's immediately in front of us. See. Remember, intelligence, uh, uh, William James defines intelligence as the uh, ability to react to an absent stimulus. See. If I can react to an absent stimulus, I must have some imagination, so something that isn't here. But a bug can only react if you touch it, also, if you're immediately in its presence, and so forth. Of course, a lot of animals have instinct they know about absent stimuli, preparing for earthquakes and things like that. But uh, if I don't know anything at, at all of the past, I uh, have no memory, I have no identity. So it's your, your memory is your identity. If you lost, people who've lost his memories lost his identity. And that's same with the people that do the same thing. And uh, we, we feel sorry for the insect 
that doesn't know what it's missing, you see. Uh, but we are built to be high-powered information centers, every one of us. And we're, the data pours in. We're battered by impressions from all sides, you see, and not just <laughs> nuclear rays, not radioactive materials. Rays and, and particles and many forms of energy are trying to get our attention. The eye cannot choose but see. We cannot bid the ear be still whether he wants to or not. Our senses feel where we be against or with our will. So these impressions and this Potential knowledge is pouring in on you all the day, and you can shed it. You can become very. Uh, you can become immune to it. You can build up a great defense system against it, uh, an immunization system. <laughs> uh, you can immunize yourself from knowledge of all sorts, and we're rather good at that because it can be very disturbing sometimes. Well, Benjamin waxed old then, so he must have taught for many years here. There has been a regular priestly collegium going on here. Priestly college. He talks about these holy men, and they were working together, and so forth. He waxed old, he saw that he must very soon go the way of all the earth. Therefore, it was thought that he should confer the kingdom on one of his sons, and this is the way he went about it. Well, we have time for this. He had Mosiah brought before him. Now, years ago, it's been reprinted numbers of times, that in the old priesthood manual, approach to the Book of Mormon, I had a breakdown of this coronation right now. In the Bible, in the Book of Kings, for example, you read that there were many kings, and you read how they got to be kings, we're told how they got to the throne and how they lost the throne. There's a lot said about it, but not one instance in the Bible tells us how a coronation was performed, what they did at a coronation. And yet, that's one thing on which we are best informed in all ancient records. In Egypt, we know every step of a coronation, and in, uh, in Babylon, and wherever you go, because it's, it's the government records and so forth, and, and the coronation is a great ritual. It's a solemn rite, and it's a historical event, too. So uh, there's the great assembly years ago, uh, oh, this here, about the great assembly. I assembled, having nothing to do with this, uh, some articles, although the whole collection of them came out, a number of articles on that came out in the, in the Western Political Quarterly, the ancient coronation ceremonies. Uh, a dozen different cases at least, you see, where this happened. They all follow exactly the same pattern, and that's the pattern that's followed here very closely. But after I wrote that, I gave quite a breakdown. All the, all the things it breaks down into, you'd be surprised uh, how elaborate and how accurate this description is of a coronation. But after I wrote this, I discovered the Nathan the Babylonian, Nathan Havavli. And here he tells us, whoops, not upside down, uh, he tells us, page 37, ah, yes. Now, as you know, the Jews sought refuge in Babylon. When, when Jerusalem was destroyed, they went to Babylon. They were kept there for many years, but many of them stayed over, and that became the Jewish center of the world. So the great, the great Talmud is the Babylonian Talmud, written in Babylon, down to the year 1040 AD. The schools were recognized in Babylon, the two great schools. And this is by Nathan the Babylonian, who was a Babylonian, who witnessed the crowning of the king in captivity. See, he is the exilarch, he's called that, or the king in captivity, or uh, the Roshka'ol, Roshka'ut. Rosh Galut, the Rosh Galut, the head of the, of the captivity, the king of the captivity. Now this, he describes the coronation. So here's, a, here's how the Jews really crowned their kings. This is the process by which they crowned their kings. He tells us about it here. And he lived in the 10th century, and he's an eyewitness of what went on there. And he starts out here, and uh, he says, the uh, Hakahal, when the council of the when the council of the Kahal, the Kahal is the whole community, our word ecclesia, ecclesiastical comes, from, it doesn't come from that, but it's supposed to, means the calling forth, well, it's the Greek equivalent, the calling forth of all the people in the general assembly. And it's when, when the Degath, when the council, the ruling council of the whole community of the people has agreed on the appointment of a king to rule in captivity, this is the way they go about it, myth kavitem, then they elect to uh, head, they, 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 they invoke the two heads, boy, three sheets to the wind today. They invoke the, the two heads of the two schools at Babylon, the one, the school of Surah and the school of Pumbadetha. Those are the two great schools. And so, well, we'll just skip it down here. This is what happens in this one. And they, uh, they hold a meeting, well, they, with all the, the heads of the schools and the heads of the people and the elders and those heads of the synagogue, and they meet at the house of a rich and important man who is greatly honored to have this, and he, he uh, pays the expenses of the preliminary meetings. They decide on who will be the king, and they make arrangements. It has to be within three days. See, 
here, he's not too fast. Mosiah says, uh, Benjamin says, suddenly, look, I'm going to uh, call the king. There's, there's not going to be any discussion because the king's going to be you, and it's going to be tomorrow. You're going to make the announcement tomorrow. Well, uh, why is it that the that Benjamin himself didn't make the announcement that my son should be king. He says, you shall make the announcement. Well, that was the practice. Why do you think the new king had to announce his coronation and not the old king? Well, you've heard the king is dead. Long live the king. He can't claim to be the king while his father's still alive. That's rebellion, you see. They have to wait till the old king's dead. Well, then how do you have the old king in the rights? Well, this is very important. You see, the Egyptians really had this developed. The new king is Horus. And that he has to get the Abia recognized by his father. Well, the high priest takes the part in the temple. It's all done by proxy, vicariously. The old king is represented vicariously. This is, this is what happens, and this is what happens here. The old king is taken by the Chazan. He takes the place of the old king. He is the precentor. And he takes that part, leads the people, and he's the one that hands the crown over. But the announcement has to be made after the king is dead. And that's why. Benjamin says to his son, you see, you will make the announcement. You have to announce. Oh, he says, I will announce that you were to be king. You will call the people together, say. You're the ones that have to summon them. He says to him here, uh, he had Mosiah brought before him. These are the words he spake to him. Notice he's ritualizing, making it very formal. These are the words he spake to him. My son, I would that he should make a proclamation. Well, why don't you make it? Well, the point is the king can't announce that the king is dead. <laughs> the son has to announce that there's going to be a new crown that ye should make a proclamation throughout all this land, among all this people of the people of Zarahemla and the people of Mosiah. Notice, still separate people. People of Zarahemla and people of Mosiah, distinction again. You're going to send out the herald. The proclamation is very important. Anyone who refuses to come will be banished from the kingdom for three years. That's the universal rule. You had to come to Rome when you received the, the, the notice, and you had to come in person. And if you didn't come, to acclaim the emperor, to claim the king at that time, <coughs> again, you would be an outlaw, you would vanish from the kingdom, you see. And uh, it's very important because, well, it tells in the book of Zechariah, and all who do not come up to Jerusalem in the proper season to hail the king there, on them shall be no rain, they shall be cut off. You see, you don't have any rights if you don't come as a true citizen and register. And you have to become registered when you, on that day, say if, when you come to Rome, if it was in Greece, to choose the king, you had to be going uh, on the list of the inkizi, the incised, because they had big lead tablets, big lead plates, swinging on sort of doors in the forum, and the names of all the citizens were written, and you had to come and check your names. It shows you were there, that you were an inkizi, you were one whose name was incised. And if you weren't one of the inkizi, you weren't a citizen, you had no rights, whatever. So it was very important for people to come and acclaim at the acclamatio. I wrote an article on the acclamatio, too, among other things, and acclaim the new king or ruler. This is what they're going to have happen. Well, he goes on here, but uh, if you've all read the account in Mosiah of the coronation, uh, let's just race through here, Nathan the Babylonian's uh, story here. Well, then all the elders assembled, and they set the new king apart. They set him apart, and they proclaimed that all the people should come together, and when on, they must all bring presents here in Book of Mormon. Notice they all bring their first fruits, because it's a, the king can only be crowned at the new year, the beginning of the new age, you see. That's why they're choosing this. Notice it says they brought first fruits. And they, it's a festival of the booze. They brought their tents, and they all camped with their tents facing the temple. Now, that's not in the Bible, but in the new temple scroll, that's exactly what happens. It's a special arrangement made for all the tribes. Each tribe has its place, and they, a place is established for their booths. Booth is a very interesting word, you see, it's, our, it's a good old English word, but it's the same as the Semitic word, bite, a house, a place where you, uh, where you throw stuff together to live in. And our word bide, abide, is to where you live temporarily. You abide in a booth, you see, in a Buddha, uh, the Boothstether of Iceland, where the people would come to the great assembly to elect the king. There was the Logberg, the mountain of the law, and from the top of that, the Govi would read the law to the people, just as Benjamin reads the law to the people here. The Govi, he was called, he was the high priest, and the people would all come and camp around there in booths, and the, the booths, the rings of those booths still remain. They were just stones to hold them down, and so forth. It tells us in the, in the Bible they were as a shelter from the sun and the rain, because it was a temporary, you were camping there, because the law is, Thou shalt not celebrate the Passover within thy gates, which the Lord thy God. Everybody had to come as a pilgrim, and everybody had to bring a gift see, in, in all these places. So you come as a pilgrim, and you live in your booths, but it tells us in the temple scroll that every booth faces the temple hill, you see. They, they, they completely surround it, they all face it. And they live in their families separately, as we're told in King Mosiah here, because the Talmud said they must feast 
and sit the families with their backs to each other in rings and the first certain rules, but in, by families, and it tells us here the same thing, that they sit by families and separated by families. So all this goes along, but I want to get back to Nathan here and the way the Jews did it in the Middle Ages uh, when, they, when they continued through the years to uh, crown a new king in captivity, but they still had their king, you see. So they followed the old established rites, and this is what happened then. So they would bring the presents, each according to his means, presents of gold, silver, the richest they could, and then was they would feast together, of course, in separate families. They would have the big feast. It was a feast, after all, a celebration. And uh, it was the great assembly, and uh, they had, on the first day, there was a procession. The first day was the last day. It's a one-day affair. It was a two-day affair, actually. And the day before, this is very important, a, a wooden tower was erected. It was 10 feet, 10 and a half feet high. No, Benjamin has a tower put up so we can speak from the top of it. He does the same thing here. No mention of towers or anything like that in the Bible, but here it is. He has the tower. It's 10 and a half feet high and uh, it's four and a half feet wide and it's broad enough to have three seats. In the center is the big seat for the king. On either side are his two counselors, the head of the school of, Pumba, of Sura on the right, the head of the school of Pumbadetha on the left, because you always have to have the president and his two counselors. Uh, but the king is the one who sits down, sits on the, on the central throne. That's the empty throne. And it was covered with cloth, with costly cloths and things, and underneath this, this uh, stand was a choir of youths, a choir of young men, uh, chosen for their voices and for the no their nobility. They had belonged to, to illustrious families and nobles. It was a very great honor to belong to the choir, and they play an important part. And Benjamin says, I'd go down when the heavenly choir sing, and so having the choir sing the song of redeeming love that, that uh, Alma talks about later on. Is it Alma who says that? Have you heard? It? Yes. Have you? So he goes on here, and uh, then uh, they open with prayer, and in which they ask for revelation, the Spirit of the Lord might be with them. Then there is a, the Sabbath hymn, they all sing a hymn, it's an antiphonal, the people sing, the chorus replies, and so forth. And then uh, there's a universal acclamation, they all stand up, and go, go along with this, this, we have the Sukhoth, and, uh, and yes, it's an antiphonal chorus. And then they sing the creation hymn, which is very important. You see, they're celebrating the foundation of the world and so forth. Uh, they sing here, in the kol chai, and then on the, by the spirit of all living things, they sing a song called By the Spirit of All Living Things. And the, open, the meeting is opened by the chazan. Now remember, he's the person who takes the place of the old king. The chazan is, is a, a cantor today, the one who sings in the, in the, uh, in the synagogue. But the Kazan was really, he was the presenter who takes the place of the old king and acts as master of ceremonies. He's the principal person there, the other king. But the other king is the one that gives the great sermon, of course. And then they give the holiness shouts. The, uh, the people repeat the prayer of the Kadosh, which is a prayer for the dead, actually, so that all people are present on this occasion. Remember, it's a great feast of the ancestors throughout the world when they make this great assembly. It's a feast of the ancestors, and they, they, the Kadosh is actually uh, the hymn for the dead, and uh, <coughs> has to do with work for the dead. And, but while the people say it in a low voice, the chorus uh, under the thing uh, gives the hallelujah shouts there. And then uh, people arise, it's then. Then all the people stand up, and utter the 18 benedictions, which have to do with the creation of the world of the 18 benedictions, the oldest, perhaps some people think the oldest text there was. And uh, then they're all seated. And then the, then the king appears. He, it says the king has been kept in concealment until now. He mounts the tower, and then he sta enters on the tower. And of course, all the people arise then. Uh, and uh, then he sits down. But the people remain standing while the two counselors come in and sit down on other, either side. They sit down, and uh, then all the people sit down again. But there's farther than that, there's a proskinesis. They fall down, you see, in the presence of the king. There's, talk about that here, the proskinesis. We saw that before, when people are overwhelmed, uh, where they want to appear overwhelmed, they go through the impression, go through the act of falling down on their faces. And that happens here. Uh, I've gone through it all with, with uh, quite an elaborate uh, bibliography of sources here. In the 23rd lesson in this, in this thing, the approach to the Book of Mormon, which is on, on reserve, it's the old priesthood manual. But uh, I didn't realize I'd broken it down into to such small sections. They, they really follow very closely along what should be done. I say we're sticking to the, 
the Jewish record here now. And then what happens? Oh, over the king's head alone, there's a magnificent baldachin cover, and the uh, seats of the two are separated. They're not right close to his, they're separated uh, by a distance. And then uh, <clears throat> with the tent, and this is an important thing because again, you get the, the temple scroll. It's important, the tenting, the living in the tents and so forth, the baldachin. And uh, then the master of ceremonies, the Chazan, he enters the tent in which the king is, this building in which the king, and gives him a blessing in a low voice that only he and the people on the stand and the chorus underneath can hear. And they, all the other people here, because it's a confidential thing and all the other people here, uh, the chorus all shouts amen at the end of certain sentences on certain occasions so they know big things are taking place. But it's all hush hush and in a low voice. And the Chazan goes in, well what he's doing, it's the old king handing over personally the rule to his son. You see, it's, it's done in a, in a mystic sort of fashion. It's done with great hush and great reverence as far as this goes. And so he gives his royal blessing comes from the tent, gives his royal blessing, and the old king blesses the new king here. And it's now the king's time to give a great sermon. So as he does, King Benjamin's sermon is delivered on this occasion, the, the old king in this case. But it's the Kazan gives the first sermon, the king gives the second. Remember the same thing, it's Benjamin that gives the sermon. You think, why not Mosiah? He's the one who's getting to be king. They both give sermons here. So he gives this sermon, uh, and now, that's over with. That's the first part of the ceremony. Notice there are two orations in, in the Book of Mormon here. That's the first part. And the second part is inaugurated by the new king himself. And he opens the proceeding, it says, uh, and he gives a sermon on the subject of Aparosh Shel Oto Hayom, which is the, prob the, the proper sermon for the particular day. It's the New Year's sermon, which is introducing with the creation and the new introduces the new year, the restoration of life and all this sort of thing. This is the sermon he gives for the day. It says, shall uh, uh, for that for that one for that very day. <coughs> oh Yetenos or he gives permission to one for one of his counselors to give the sermon. He can do that too. Uh, and it's very interesting there was an interpreter there because they're not speaking the language of the people here. There's the whole thing's being held in is being in Hebrew, and these people are speaking Aramaic. They've been living in Babylon a long time. They're speaking the Eastern Aramaic dialect here. So they don't understand the sermon. So again, you see this business of the two languages going. Why Benjamin had his sons learn the languages and so forth, because they're, they're, going to, they're going to now read from the Book of the Law, and the people can't understand it. There's an interpreter there all the time. In the next, the king himself personally interprets the, the Book of the Law to them. That's exactly what Benjamin does, Messiah does. They interpret the law to the people. Because from now on, the Mosai from the rest of the Book of Mormon, the law that Mosa Benjamin, it says the law that Benjamin and Mosiah gave them, right to the end, that is the basic law. That's the organic law of the Nephites, and it's based on the law of Moses. There is their reading, uh, application of it. Well, then they have a silentium. The, the big thing happens. The, after this introductory sermon, there is a silentium. That's a very important thing when the, uh, even in the Byzantine court, they call it silentium. It's the Latin word for being silent. But it just comes from, you get it in Psalms, the very famous introduction they, that they give it, all the churches use it. God has entered into his holy temple, let all the earth hush before him. That means be quiet. When God enters the temple, then there must be an absolute hush, and boy, do they insist on it here. If anybody breaks the silence by so much as a tziff tziff, it says by so much as a tziff tziff, which means a, a whisper or a twitter, I love the Hebrew word for, for birds. It's chirp, chipor. Uh, you can't say the word without chirping like a bird. <laughs> and uh, that's what the word is. You just write it out like that. But anyway, it says there not to be a twitter, not a sound. And uh, so there's a silentium when the, uh, in the, uh, and the Meister singers, remember when they're going to inaugurate the mysteries of the, of the guild, of, mu of the musicians' guild, uh, first announcement is one, two, three, silentium, silentium, mach kind and kind gazum. Be silent in all his presence. And this came from the Byzantine court, which came from the Persian court, which you find all over the Old World. The, the important, well, I say you actually find it in, in the Old Testament too, that very famous saying, the Lord has entered his holy, is in his holy temple, that all the earth, chas lefana, means hush, that's our word hush, chas lefana, hush before his face, call haaretz, all the earth. And so they do the same thing here, and they, in this, uh, 
Babylonian version, and they demand absolute silence and awe. And then uh, when the Kazan starts reading, he covers his face, and if anybody whispers or says a sound, he, op he, he, gives, he retire, recites the whole speech with his eyes closed. And if anybody utters a sound, he opens his eyes and looks at them, and it says the people are overwhelmed by the most unspeakable ema wurada, with unspeakable fear and terror, because he's in an inspired state. It's the same thing up here. Remember, we feel the people are smitten here by the things they hear. But if anybody, if there's any lack of discipline, any whispering, as it says here, that's the word it gives them. It's for uh, he opens his eyes and gives you one look. Remember, he has his face covered with a talit. It says the talit. And with that look, is absolutely petrifying. The people just freeze all of them, it says here. And so he carries his question. And he gives the sermon from the law. And then there's a question period. Uh, there's a certain old man, who, a learned old man, who is supposed to reply for the people when a question and answer period. You can answer anything you want. And again, remember, uh, a, uh, there is a dialogue in, in Benjamin. He explains things, everything that people want to know, and so forth, and we do this sort of thing. And he gives the answers, and uh, uh, he begins by saying, it's a very interesting thing, the, the thing, uh, the melat, tzarikat, it's necessary for you to understand these things, is what it says. Not only does he have the translator there, but then, is there any questions, you see? So make it clear that people understand this is being given for their benefit. It's a very interesting thing here, at last. Uh, and then, this is the first time he's called the prince. Uh, and all the people then shout. After he's given the speech, the people all shout together, long live the king, for the first time. It's the nasi, they call him a nasi, that's the king, the prince, of course, nasi, very famous. Uh, Rosh Gala, long live the, the prince, the ruler of the captivity, the ruler of the people. Well, Gala means uh, revelation, people, means both, all sorts of things, uh, a thing of, uh, which is an unfolding or revealing and so forth. But then they shout, long live the king. Now he's officially the king at last. They, they finally acclaim him, long live the king. The uh, and the uh, and long live, and love may we live, and long may the people of Israel live. And after that, then the presenter, that's the Hazan again, he blesses the king and consecrates him. He is now the king. And then he reports the condition of the kingdom. A financial report is given. Very interesting thing here. Condition of the donations that have been given on this occasion. And he blesses the givers. And then the king receives the book of the law. And then he stands up and expounds the law to the people. And this is the main thing. The king discoursing to the people from a tower on the law that they're supposed to obey and so forth. The laws and customs of the people. This great sermon on the law. And then it closes with a prayer. The king is blessed. And the book of the law and all the people cry, Amen. We accept. They all must cry, Amen. You accept it. He presents it. Well, now this is the picture we get, and then they all go home. Uh, this is the picture we get in the, uh, in the Book of Mormon. It's the same thing goes on here. And I say, when was this discovered? In the late 19th century sometime. But, <coughs> but more interesting, of course, is the use of the... A oh, wait, we've gone way over time. I'm sorry here. So you shouldn't find it too hard to understand what goes on here, but it's, it's the sermons that count because they're directed to us. And he lowers the beam. This is the interesting thing. I mean, this is the great occasion of the national celebration. Uh, if ever there was a successful people standing tall, mourning and all that sort of thing, and all he does is th throw cold water on the whole thing. He just drenches them in it. He says, you fools, you don't, don't see things as they are at all. Don't, don't get any big ideas about yourselves. You look out, you see.